Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> it's good to be here again tonight, uh, especially with the chair I get to sit in. Uh, uh, for those listening by tape, I'm sure they have a view of me standing in some pulpit, but actually I'm sitting in a nice uh, brown leather chair with a nice brown leather ottoman with my bare feet propped up with my jeans on. So uh, anyway, that's where the anointing is, so that's... Uh, Right, at least tonight, that's that's where it's flowing. So we're going we're going to follow the spirit here. <laughs> uh, thank you for coming out. Uh, I think most of you know that I could probably teach this in a room of empty, uh, not a, of empty people, but a r empty room, and be just as uh, happy. In fact, I've preached to empty people before, <laughs> and <laughs> especially because based on some of the responses we've gotten before. <laughs> but uh, this gospel is a wonderful, wonderful gospel. And I, after many years, uh, began to see why they call it good news. Uh, this is good news. It's good news to everybody. I remember when, uh, I think it was Keith Green, uh, one of the more popular uh, kind of uh, rock gospel singers, uh, back several years ago, he came out with a song that was uh, called Bad News for Modern Man. Uh, and do you remember that one, Glenn? Yeah. Bad news for modern man, bad news for the human race. God's coming, he's going to judge his place, something like that. I don't know. It was one of those real uplifting songs, anyway. Yes, he did. He had a lot of those uh, songs of just a, a lot of judgment. But, um, and another uh, case in point, not uh, criticizing, but uh, was also one that taught that if you did everything right, preached just right, and um, uh, lived right, that God's protection was on you. And uh, he uh, got in an airplane one evening a number of years back, and because the plane, I think, was overloaded, uh, the plane went down. And uh, they were, I think everyone on board was killed. I know that Keith was killed. It was quite a tragic accident, not to point to that Keith had faults and failures. It's obvious that he did, and we all did, but... <laughs> that is not what made the plane go down. Uh, it was overloading the airplane, uh, and no telling what the uh, mindset could have been. Wouldn't it be tragic, though, that if they overloaded the airplane believing that God would protect them no matter what? If so many people were supposed to go, so we know we're overloading the plane, but it's God's will that we go there, so everything's going to be all right. Uh, we don't know that, but uh, obviously the mentality in that doctrine was there for that to have possibly uh, been. But there's no need in speculating about that, whatever caused us to get off on that. I think uh, uh, it's just the fact that modern-day evangelical Christianity struggles so hard to come up with answers for why things happen, and uh, to the good and to the bad, and it is virtually always placed into the, in the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Um, yeah, I was thinking, of course, everyone has spoken of the Columbine incident, and uh, just as I was getting ready, sometime today that came up again. Um, and, of course, the young girl who confessed that she believed in God and uh, was, was shot and now, of course, has become uh, a martyr. Um, the, you know, the fact of it is they just asked if anybody there believed in God, which most Christians would normally say that's not good enough anyway. So uh, she professed that she believed in God. There was not a reaction. Do you believe that Jesus Christ is Lord and Savior of your life? It wasn't like she came to an altar call and denied Christ or confessed Christ either. But uh, it, it's funny because I, I, I remembered that story made me remember something I saw in the 700 Club and how that... Um, uh, they were talking about how that if you had enough faith that God would protect you. You, of course, know all of those doctrines. <clears throat> and they had a lady on who was in a hostage situation uh, in, uh, in a clothing store, and she was, the man had a gun, and uh, he came through. She stepped out of the dressing room, uh, trying on a dress, and was confronted by a man uh, wielding a gun. And uh, she called upon the name of the Lord, and the man tried to lift the gun, couldn't lift the gun, he was paralyzed, couldn't do anything, and then he was incapable because
because of her belief that her faith was so good that she was saved from a uh, gun-yielding man. Yet at Columbine, they say that she was killed because of her faith. Ah! You know, it's like somebody gets some sanity here as to which one, what's what, you know, what's what. Let's just decide what's what somewhere along the line. All right, come on in. And um, uh, what we're going to look at tonight is uh, the gospel that's in Ephesians. This uh, gospel of the redemption of the world is very clearly brought out in Ephesians. And what we're going to do, since we can't cover the entire book, what we're going to do is look at basically what the introduction is, and then we are going to cover the uh, chapter 2 of the book of Ephesians. And if you're ready, we will start. Ephesians chapter 1, beginning at uh, the very first verse. Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, by the will of God, to the saints which are at Ephesus, and to the faithful in Christ Jesus. Grace be to you and peace from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who hath blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places. So where are all spiritual blessings? They're in heavenly places. That's important a little bit later on because he will reveal to us how many people are in heavenly places. And that's, uh, of course, what is at issue with uh, the teaching and what we are dealing with in uh, this little series that we're doing. Has blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. So this is in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. According as he hath chosen us in him before the foundation of the world, now, uh, predestination uh, teachers, of course, visit this verse. And it says that God hath done what? He hath chosen us in him before the foundation of the world. And, of course, without seeing that Jesus redeemed the entire world by the power of his blood, then predestination teaching would tell you that who, that God chose whoever's going to heaven and whoever he didn't choose is going to hell, that that's all predetermined. Here it's obvious that something was predetermined before the foundation of the world. And uh, this goes on, and the consistency of this never varies all the way through uh, this teaching. Um, According as he has chosen us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love. Wow. So this selection of being in Christ that was made, it says, before the foundation of the world, would qualify you for being what? Holy and without blame before God in love. That's interesting because that is the characteristics of love. Love always sees the best and never finds fault. This is very, very conducive and in agreement with what we know about the love chapter uh, that is that is taught is that we stand before God holy and without blame before him in love having predestined us to the adoption of children by Jesus Christ to himself and there is the term predestination according to the good pleasure of his will now this predestination is based on what survival of the fittest based on, this predestination is based upon uh, the pleasure of his will. Now, can anybody think of any verse that talks about how many people God wants to be redeemed? It is the will of God, and we can visit so many places where that it lets us know what God's will is and was about the redemption of the world, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Uh, this this redemption was for the world. Uh, this predestination, if to take this out of context and say some are predestined, it is obvious predestination that is the term predestined is in here. But then to divide the human race on this and say some are predestined and some are not, you have to decide that the predestination 
was made according to the will of God. And it was not God's will that any should perish. I don't have the right to reduce the predestination to what I think would qualify before God for being predestined before God for redemption. I must accept the premise for that uh, predestination being that it's based on the pleasure of his will. And there is no place that the prophets foretold of that God would be real pleased with redeeming part of the earth. There is no place that any prophet spoke of anything except the pleasure of God's will being fulfilled in the fact that Jesus was coming to this earth to redeem the world from the sin, from sin, from that is the condition of sin. To the praise of his glorious grace. Wow. This is what causes praise to his glorious grace. To the praise of his glorious grace, his perfect will was that none should perish. Therefore, he predestined that all would be in Christ. And this is to what? To the praise of his glorious, undeserved, unmerited favor toward man. This is good news. It's already, I'm already at that point where it's like, okay, it's time to turn Pentecostal here and just stop and have a dance. This is good news, all right? Good news. To the praise of his glorious grace, wherein he hath made us accepted in the beloved. He made us accepted in the beloved. We did not make ourselves accepted. There is no indication that man's will, man's active participation was required for this to be done, for uh, us to be accepted by God. In whom we have redemption. Wow. In whom. Now, whom all did he say was predestined? It was, and everyone was predestined according to the will of God. And we know his will. Again, I hate to be redundant about this, but this is such a, uh, uh, an issue for some people. They see the issue of predestination here, but then because they cannot accept that Jesus could have done this for the whole world, they start saying, well, some are and some aren't. But again, if we're going to validate predestination of redemption, and who is, and it said that, it, that we were chosen before the, the foundation of the world to be in Christ. Good news. We were chosen before the foundation of the world to be in Christ. And the, in him, then, is where we find this acceptance in the beloved. And this is also those that are in him, in whom, in whom we have redemption through his blood and forgiveness of sins, according to, again, what? the riches of his grace. Wow. Now, so far, can anyone here see anyone left out of this redemption? There's, there's not a list of who's left out and who is not. And many people say, yeah, but I read that list Paul gave. There's no, no liars and no thieves. And, uh, they forget the one that people that are in strife uh, also aren't going to make it. All three lists in the New Testament are different. And the one in the book of Galatians is completely open-ended. It says, it says and, and, uh, and many such things. So add whichever sin you want to add. There's nobody that, nobody that by the law is going to qualify. And that's the reason God predestined to free us from the law, the entire world, even though the law was only given to the Jew, the Gentile, Paul said, became a law unto themselves. They didn't even need it. It is such human nature. Guilt creates laws. And, and eventually control, absolutely. Uh, or at least attempted control. Uh, certainly not self-control, does it? But uh, uh, it says, in whom will we have redemption through his blood, and the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of his grace, wherein he hath abounded toward us in all wisdom and prudence or understanding. Uh, amazing. Having made known unto us the mystery of his will, 
according to his good pleasure, which he purposed in himself. Here we go into this issue of his will. It's being defined even clearer. The issue of God's will, predestination. And there's only one subject being talked about here, and it's predestination. And what was the selection of predestination? Well, it says it was done by God. It was done by his will. And it says that it was done according to the pleasure of him who purposed it in himself. So whatever was going to happen, all God had to do. How many of you believe that all God had to do is purpose it, and that's the way it was going to be? Well, it's obvious. I mean, if, if God couldn't purpose something and then couldn't do it, he wouldn't be God. Can anyone think of any logical reason why God would purpose to redeem part of the human race? His creation. Why would there... Why would I mean, this is his creation. The human race is his creation. Why would he purpose in himself to redeem part? Now, whatever anyone would say, this redemption is based on predestination. That's what we've been reading through here. This redemption is based on predestination. Predestination is based upon the will of God. The will of God is based on what he purposed in himself to do. So whatever God decided in himself to do became his will. His will then was applied to this issue called predest to, to be predestined. And what did he say? We were predestined to be in Christ. Wow. Good news. And in Christ, what did we, what did we find in Christ? Redemption. And what else? Forgiveness of sins. And what does this cause from the human being? Praise to his glorious grace. That's the result. You see, we're, we're trying to become a part of it, and it's causing praise to go to men, not praise to his glorious grace. Even our testimony sessions have wind up with praise to glorious man. Uh, my whole, quote, ministry was built on me giving my testimony of uh, just how bad I was and then just how much I changed. And, and it's like, wow, that is a trophy of God's grace. Folks, no human being is a trophy of God's grace. Jesus is the trophy of God's grace. Uh, there is nothing about me that will make me a trophy of God's grace. Because when we say that, what we're saying is not, oh, look, he was redeemed without his works. We are saying, oh, look, how drastically his works are changed. That is a trophy of God's grace. So by the statement even being made, a person is a real trophy of God's grace, what we are saying is grace is based on works, that it's a performance. Think of everyone that you've ever heard of that say that that is a real trophy of God's grace. It's based on how bad they used to be and how good they are now. Okay. <laughs> it says that in the dispensation of the fullness of time, the fullness of time, that's a very interesting statement, that he might gather together in one all things in Christ, which are on earth and in heaven, in whom also we have obtained an inheritance, being predestina uh, uh, predestinated according to the purpose of him who worketh all things after the counsel of his own will. Now, if this was all I knew about the Bible, were these first introductory ten verses. It so emphatically says that redemption is a predestined selection that God made. It very clearly says that that predestined selection was made based on what God purposed in himself to do. Whatever he purposed in himself to do became his will in predestinating whatever he was predestinating and now 
we don't even have to wonder. We find out that in that predestination, whoever is predestined, you cannot get into Christ. According to these verses, who are the only people who are in Christ? Those that are predestined. Those, there is no, Paul's made that clear. It was God's choice. It was God's will, God's plan, God's predestination, and only those predestined are in Christ. Now, whoever is in Christ has received what? Redemption and forgiveness of sins. And what does it result in? An extreme thankful heart to the praise of his glorious grace. Um, I don't know how you get half the world in hell, well, actually more than half, uh, because the Christian world is very small, folks. And then of that, then, of course, you know, you can't go unless you're speaking tongues. And then, of course, the women who cut your hair, you can't go either. And uh, then, of course, if you ever go out and, and, uh, and do what you used to do, then you never were really redeemed in the first place. And if you go out and sin again, then you've lost it. So even in the Christian community, there's very few going to make it, according to the doctrines, the multitude the multitude of doctrines defining what qualifies us for redemption based on thousands of different denominations and groups of Christianity just in America, all with a different view of it. This so far, we're relying not on a group or their definition. We are relying, or at least attempting to rely on, what was God's will? What was God's will? And does God, did God get his way? Can God purpose something in his heart, decide that it is his will, and then not get his way? <laughs> Heard Rod Parsley say the other day, he got a great revelation. Rod Parsley <laughs> heard it the other day on TVN. Got a great revelation from God. Sweat flying everywhere. I don't know why revelations require sweat nowadays. That's right. Working for that revelation. But he got a great revelation that he, he said that the Bible says Jesus is Lord. Therefore, he knows beyond the shadow of a doubt that at least 51% of the population of the world going to heaven because Jesus is Lord. And if 50-50 went, 50, it was 50-50, it would be a tie between Jesus and the devil. If only 49 made it, the devil would be Lord. So 51% makes Jesus Lord. He is far much farther along now, once he realizes that only about one-tenth of one minute, one millisecond percent believe what he teaches, uh, he's going to have a hard time believing that 51% of them is going to make it who don't even believe anything that Rod Parsley preaches as to proclaiming to the gospel. I don't know how he's going to resolve that, but that's his heart. Anyway. These verses are very, very profound. And uh, uh, do you know that even if what Rod Parsley said was true, 51%, do you realize that even at this point in human history, God would have had to redeem people who never heard the gospel to achieve those percentages? God would have had to decide to take people to heaven who never heard the gospel, who never changed enough to even meet Rod Parsley's revelation of this winner called Jesus. I think Jesus is Lord not because he gets 51%, because this is not a ball game. This is not a political election. This is God. This is Jesus. And Jesus being Lord doesn't mean 51% Lord. 
it is 100% Lord, Brother Rod. I'm sure he would not want to disagree with me at all. I'm sure if he hears this tape, he would agree readily because if 51% means Jesus is Lord, he would surely want to agree with me about 100%, no doubt. Great faith. <laughs> Ephesians chapter 2 is where we're going. Isn't that an amazing foundation for this book? That God has predestined this. Folks, I, I, I've had this taken and taught ex excluded. Uh, it is either totally excluded by evangelical Christianity or predestinationists. They, they hold it uh, as that some are predestined and some aren't. Uh, uh, otherwise, it's totally free will religion based on, or uh, man's free will based on evangelical Christianity. Okay, chapter 2. And you hath he quickened who were dead in trespasses and sins. Now, when did he quicken whoever he quickened? He quickened them while they were dead in trespasses and sin. I think it says it's interesting that it says trespasses and sins. Because the trespasses is what violates the law. Then this sin evidently is not a violation of the law. I'd like to look it up now that I'm looking at it, but it would almost have to be the sin of unbelief. The sin, sin or sins being many people of unbelief. He says, wherein in times past you walked. You walked in that. You walked in this trespass against the law. You walked in the sin of unbelief. In times past, uh, according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience. Now, remember, he didn't say the spirit that works in the children who disobey. He said it's the spirit that was working in the children of disobedience and the children of disobedience was the children born under Adam. But thank God, we are now not the children of disobedience. We are the children of obedience. We are not the children who obey. It's a big difference. It's a vast difference of the emphasis as to whose disobedience is responsible and whose obedience is responsible for the condition of the human race which we went through in detail in a very clear description that Paul gave us in Romans chapter 5. Among whom also we had our conversation in times past. Our conversation uh, uh, in, time, in times past. You know, virtually every time Paul says the term in time past, he's talking about back when we used to be under the law, or they. In fact, he states it very clearly in Galatians chapter 1. He said, in time past, when I taught in the Jews' religion. And he said, in time past, uh, uh, the lust of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and the mind, and by, by nature, children of wrath, even as others. We were children of, children of wrath, even as others. Now, when he's talking about we had our conversation in times past, based on the lust of the flesh. What is this conversation with people talk, sitting around and talking about uh, naked people and sex? and uh, What was this conversation about? He, now, Paul included himself in this. Paul said, we used to all sit around and have these conversations that were fulfilling what? The lust of the flesh. The lust and the desires of the flesh and the mind. But what was the flesh, the mind, lusting after under the law? It wanted justification. It wanted, through its own obedience, to be justified. And Paul said, we all had our conversations in this in time past. Now, I don't care what anybody says to me. There is no way that I will ever be convinced when he says, among whom we had in times past, uh, uh, we all had our conversations in times past in the lust of our flesh. 
You never convince me. He's talking about people talking about saying, yeah, man, I want to do this. Yeah, man, ooh, yeah, man, I really want to. Ooh, I'd really like to go out and do this. I, oh, yeah, my flesh is just lusting after that woman. Just, oh, yeah, man, we're, uh, there is no way. There is no context of that. The issue is law and grace. The flesh will never be justified by the law, Paul said. But the flesh has always wanted to be justified in itself. This conversation in the lust of the flesh, fulfilling the lust of the flesh and the mind, folks, those conversations are self-righteous conversations of being right with God based on their performances under the law. That's what the lust... There's nothing, you know, the, there's something the flesh has always wanted much more than hot fudge cake. The flesh has wanted justification. The flesh craves it. The flesh lusts after it. And still to this day, there's no justification for the flesh. That's the reason that in God's eyes, the Bible says that Jesus nailed your flesh to the cross. You're dead, and your life is hid with Christ in God. A tremendous, tremendous thing has happened to us. Do you know that most Christian conversations, most evangelical Christian conversations are this? They are conversations in the lust of the flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind. Now, I didn't say conversations at the bar. I said conversations at church amongst Christians. Lustful conversations. Lust, the lust of the flesh. Trying to quench the desire of the mind. Paul teaches on this very extensively in the book of Romans, especially chapters 5, 6, 7, and 8. Uh, and tells us what that flesh has wanted. Flesh has always wanted it. Flesh has always wanted justification. It can't have it. And it's time that the conversations about it, Paul says it needs to be in times past. <laughs> Thank God when that day comes, huh? But God is rich in mercy for his great love wherewith he loved us. Even when we were dead in sin, Having, uh, and hath quickened us together with Christ, by grace are you saved. Now, when were we quickened? We were quickened with Christ. Now, when was Christ quickened? And the term quickened means, literally means just brought back from the dead. It means to be brought to life. We were what? We were brought to life when? When you went up in the altar call, you were dead in sin, and whenever Christ was quickened was when you were quickened. Good news. It didn't say that Jesus would be quickened, and then a quickening, quickening would be continue to quicken until this earth was quickened out. There's no progressive quickening. When Christ was quickened, the human race was quickened with him before God. You say, well, what does believing have to do with all of this? Folks, this is what creates believing, finding out you've been quickened, finding out you've been redeemed, finding out that you, that you have uh, the uh, cleansing power of the blood of the Lamb already in your life, not because you believed, but because of the faith of Jesus Christ. And even if it was based on our belief, how good did you believe? Did you believe good enough? Did you believe in the right church, under the right doctrine? The reason most folks get so very defensive about questioning doctrine is because we have found our security in the group we belong to rather than in Christ. And we're afraid that if our if, if we have found our security in our group, whatever our group is persuaded of, then to have another idea introduced 
is very frightening because it may mean we could be wrong. But you see, to the person who could be wrong who's found security in the group, if the group's wrong, they doubt their salvation. Folks, it's been, I've, it's been wonderful to be free to be wrong. <laughs> you know, if you're not free to be wrong, you'll always be wrong. Because you can't change your mind. If you can't be wrong, you can't change your mind. Proverbs says only a fool never changes his mind. And then I hear that the greatest glory that some of our teachers in the movement that I was in have preached the same thing, and it hasn't changed for 60 years. Now, folks who have learned nothing, I don't, I don't think I'd go around practicing about that. I've learned nothing in 60 years. The gospel of the grace of God is so glorious, it's infinite, it is, it is, it is awesome, constantly learning more about it. Grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And then to brag that we have taught the same thing for 60 years. I don't think that deserves a Sunday school batch. Even when we were dead in sin, hath quickened us together with Christ, by grace you are saved, and hath raised us up together, all right, and made us to sit in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Now, over here, it told us how many people were raised up in heavenly places in chapter 1. Remember when I asked you to remember that term, heavenly places? And we went through this predestination issue of chapter 1. How many were predestined? What was it? How, how did they get predestined? It was by the will of God. God purposed it in his heart. And it's in those heavenly places in Christ Jesus that this revelation then comes to the praise of his glorious grace. So by the time we get into chapter 2, we've already had told to us in chapter 1 just how many people it was God's will to be in heavenly places. It was God's will for everyone. God purposed it that way. And to say it's not that way is to say that God's will is not done in the earth. You say, well, of course it's not done in the earth. Look around. No, you don't look at things. You look at Jesus to see whether or not God's will has been done in the earth. Hebrews chapter 10, Jesus said, for it is written in, in the passage in the book of the scriptures, he said, it is written of me, I have come to do thy will, O God. In that he has come, and, and in that he saith, I have come to do thy will, O God, he taketh away the first, that he may establish the second. It was God's will to take away the first covenant, which was the law which eliminated the entire human race, to establish the second covenant, which would include all of the human race. Folks, why would God establish a covenant that excluded everyone? and then create a new one that would include a few. The type and shadow is just not consistent. The first one was, to die, was designed not to redeem anybody. What was the conclusion of the first covenant? There is how many righteous? There's none righteous. No, not one. Now, if the first one brought the absolute conclusion that there is no righteousness, if there is a new covenant at all, what did it bring? It brought righteousness. Do you think people, do you think that becoming a Christian or becoming a believer makes you a better acting person than the people all the way through the old covenant? Of course it does not. And anyone who would admit, even after your conversion experience, thank God for conversion, that's not what we're talking about. We're talking about redemption. Anyone who's gone through conversion knows that you still have some of the same dirty thoughts you had before you got converted. Now, we're not going to have testimonies right now or anything. So. <laughs> but I tell you what, there's filthy conversation going on in the body of Christ, and it has nothing to do with sex, drugs, rock and roll. There is vile communication going on. Paul said this used to be a part of our lives. He said it shouldn't be around us anymore. He said this kind of communication should not be part of our lives. 
in context, he's not talking about us talking about dirty things. He's talking about self-righteous fulfillment of justification for the flesh through the law. And he calls it filthy communication. He calls it corruptness. He calls it wickedness. Thank God we're getting out of that filthy communication, aren't we? Praise God. How many of you recognize how filthy it is now that you got out of it? It's like, oh, ugh, barf. Never, ever ends. Yes, and I'll say it again. The voice of evangelical Christianity. The gospel will silence. Let me put it this way. The gospel will silence the voice of evangelical Christianity. Because the gospel is just the opposite to evangelical Christianity. It's not, it's not, the gospel is not as is taught by Paul, was pro prophesied by the prophets. How many prophets foretold of a time when man's belief would redeem him? Go read Isaiah. Go read Jeremiah, Ezekiel, Daniel, Hosea, Zephaniah, Habakkuk. Read all of them. Read all the prophecies about this redemption and find one place where man's belief is included in God's redemptive power over the earth. Well, if those things are a true doctrine, the prophets were not privy to them. The prophets were not privy to modern-day evangelical Christianity because the prophets never foretold of what we now preach. In fact, the prophets were told that God would, by his own arm, by his own salvation, by his own will, by his own right hand, by his own righteousness, redeem the world. And who would he redeem? The ungodly, the unbelieving. He said he would redeem every, uh, all of these groups, all of this, all of these different. Uh, 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 and in fact, everything we say is required. The prophets foretold that 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 God would redeem those people who didn't do those things that evangelical Christianity says is required. But Mike, it says in the New Testament that for God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, so who, that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish but have everlasting life. Yes, he sent his son into the world and gave the world one last chance to have a part or prove, actually, that they had no part in redemption, including believing. As Jesus taught and preached and walked about this earth, he, he started out, man, the throngs followed, the groups followed. And then one day he got up and said, you got to eat my flesh and drink my blood. Some said, See you later, Jesus. In fact, said many went their own way then. But he that believeth to the end shall be saved. How many believed right to the end? Not one. Does it strike you strange? There was no one rallying around Jesus, yelling, we are believers during the crucifixion. In fact, even the guy who said, I will never deny you, Jesus said, Peter, you'll deny me three times before the night's out. There's no mention. They, it, they, they, they were there. It, it mentions the fact of their relationship with him, but not anything about them believing and being the Son of God. Mm hmm. Yeah, that's right. And, 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 you know, the fact of it is, if they could doubt with viewing all the miracles, uh, I mean, wouldn't we have a little room to doubt? But believing is a very powerful thing. Now, they believed because they saw. Remember he said, blessed are they that believe that haven't seen all these miracles? Folks, I think that the reason he said that is because of the blessedness of people who were redeemed would get the revelation of it and believe. That's the reason he was excited about 
the believers that were coming compared to those who were saying they believed then because they were believing based on the works that they saw. A believer now should believe because of the revelation of what Christ has done for them and has made them to be before they ever believed. Does my believing redeem me or does my redemption make a believer out of me? That's the true question. Now, continuing on from wherever I was. See, and he, uh, it's verse 6, because we were referring back to chapter 1 again. And hath raised us up together and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus, that into ages to come he might show the exceeding riches of his grace in his kindness toward us through Christ Jesus. How much of the world did he express this kindness toward? It was the whole world. But if you don't believe, you're going to burn in hell forever. Wow. Um, not a great expression of kindness there. It says, for by grace are you saved. You know, and then the, but the argument comes. I, I really do want to address those arguments just a moment. But you had a free will to believe. You had a choice. Folks, if anyone presented the gospel accurately, everyone would believe. If anyone had a personal visit from Jesus like Paul did, was Paul on the verge of conversion when Jesus showed up? <laughs> he had letters in his hands taking them to have those who did believe in him killed. If God is just, and it requires believing to be redeemed. If God sent someone to hell without going to the same extent that he did to get Paul saved, God is not a just God. Or is the fact that what Paul's experience was was not redemption, it was conversion to believe the redemption he already had. Paul definitely went through a conversion. Folks, we're not questioning redemption. We're not questioning being born again. We're not questioning uh, salvation. We are questioning evangelical Christianity's order in which they say it must come. And it becomes absolute ludicrous when light of the sacrifice of Jesus and what is prescribed as the will of God to say that belief has to become come before redemption can come. Well, the Bible does tell us that it's by faith, but whose faith? Paul repeated several times, it's by the faith of the Son of God. Oh, and then other translations, well, the other translations don't say the faith of the Son of God, it says faith in Christ. Well, none of the other translations says that Jesus was the author and you were the finisher of faith, so. So they can debate and argue about the translations, about whether or not it's the faith of Christ or faith in Christ. It is conclusive that Jesus is the author and finisher of faith. So which, de which translation am I going to believe? Folks, it, I, I'm going to believe the one that says that it's the faith of Christ instead of faith in Christ because Jesus is the author and the finisher of faith. It is his faith. It is his, his obedience. It was his redemption.
because the work of the cross redeemed man as far as relationship with God without his belief, but his belief can make his heart and mind conducive to the redemption that he's already completed by God by himself without his belief. So before the cross, the requirement was believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. That's all you got to do. That's the only work that you have to do. And remember that Jesus, they asked Jesus what work they had to do. You know that Jesus ascribed believing in him was a work? <laughs> they asked, what work must we do that we might have eternal life? And they said, he said, believe on him that God has sent. That's all you got to do. But Jesus ascribed that as a work. He didn't, they didn't say, what work must we do? And he didn't say, oh, you don't have to work at all. All you have to do is believe. They asked, what work must we do? And he said, this is the work you've got to do. In fact, he said, this is the work. Believe on him. That's, that's right. That's when they were still under the last and final great requirement for the human race to be a part of redemption. And the human race failed. Peter, James, John, all of them failed to continue their belief in Christ. You know what they say after he died? Go fishing. <laughs> I mean, you know, and, and you know, and and what did Jesus do? My goodness, what did he do? Come back from the dead and say, "You bunch of jerks! Here I was trying to prove to the world that I was Lord, and even you failed me. What what a Lord to do anyway? <laughs> he didn't come back derailing them." He didn't come back berailing Peter. You let Peter know that was never held against him in the first place. Wow. Awesome Lord. Awesome Savior. You know, that brings up another thing. People say, oh, well, you're, you're saved as long as you, if you, if you deny it. It's like the girl. The indication is that evangelical Christianity is if that girl would have denied that she knew the Lord, she would have gone to hell. That's the other side of that story at Columbine. The, at least in most of evangelical Christianity, not all. But the fact of it is, the man who preached the first sermon after the Holy Spirit descended from heaven and over 3,000 people came to the Lord, denied Jesus three times out loud in front of everybody. So it sounds like the key, if we're going to follow biblical principle, the key to becoming anointed to preaching the gospel is you got to first deny Jesus three times. Isn't that what everybody does with the Bible? They look and see, well, this happened to this person. This is what they did. And look over here, what happened after that. That's the key. This is what we got to do now. And, well, Peter denied him three times and then became the guy who preached the first sermon under the anointing of the Holy Spirit. Absolutely. Great Pope. He's in a gold box at the Vatican. I saw him. <laughs> <coughs> Oh, folks, this gospel is great. I, for my mind to even think that I used to think this cart before the horse, evangelical Christianity is just unthinkable to me anymore. Oh, thank God. And people have warned me, oh, you're getting close to that doctrine that's going to cause people not to share the gospel. Why share with anybody then if everybody's redeemed? My God, what a selfish mentality. What else would you want to do more than people that were redeemed? Let them know about it. What good news we have. Not threatening news. Turn or burn. <laughs> he didn't say the gospel was a threat. He says it's good news. It's not a threat. It is good news. And good news is, news is something that's already happened. This isn't a good prophecy. The gospel isn't a good prophecy. That's something that's going to happen in the future. This is good news. It's something that's already happened. And that's redemption. Amen?
Absolutely. And how could believing do anything if you weren't already redeemed? See, and we went through this principle about truth last night. The way evangelical Christianity preaches the cross, they preach that belief creates truth. Suddenly, redemption becomes truth. But belief doesn't create truth in any other realm we know of. Truth can produce belief. But belief cannot create truth. That's when people wind up in mental institutions because they think what they believe is truth, and it's not. It's not truth. They become delusional in thinking that what they believe is truth. But folks, truth, when it is established, when you believe it, then you make progress mentally and emotionally. The very same comparison can be made back with you know uh, all of the, my gosh, look at the lives of Galileo and the people who established certain basic truths. You know, do you know that it was a doctrine of the church that the world was flat? It was a church doctrine. It, it was a church doctrine, and you were a heretic if you didn't believe that. Galileo almost lost his life. One of his fellow teachers did lose his life, but Galileo wound up uh, imprisoned and uh, uh, with his life restricted in his old age. But uh, when man finally accepted that the world was round rather than flat, did that make it round? It was already round long before they believed it. But what did it do once they believed the truth? It freed them from all... Look at how civilization advanced. The fears dropped. And people then, I'm still afraid to get in the big ship, well, especially the kind they got in and sell out beyond where I can see shoreline. I'm not going, I don't like the water that much. Anyway, but look, how, look what it freed people to do. Never has the belief of something to try to make it true led to the advancement of any civilization. It has led to its total absolute inability to evolve mentally, emotionally, socially, or in any other way. But when any society begins to accept truths that are already established, it advances that society. I don't care if it's spiritual truth, natural truth, uh, uh, physical truth, whatever it is. But if we try to establish truth with our beliefs, we are paralyzed. And this is, and I, do you see why I'm excited about the future now? I mean, it's, it's control. And that's the reason the church didn't want that doctrine taught. They didn't want the control taken away. And it's the same reason they don't want this preached. It's because they don't want to take the control away. My God, you may become so integrated with the rest of the world, their system might not be needed. Oh, God forbid. <laughs> yeah. But do you see the logic of it? This is just, I mean, it, and this is consistent. This is consistent all the way through the history of man. This, we're dealing with what has been made uh, the entire human race uh, progress from one point to the next. It is not. It's believing something, trying to make it true, is voodoo. Believing, trying to make truth out of it, is witchcraft. And the gospel is none of those things. Belief cannot establish truth. Truth can establish belief. But a belief that tries to establish truth is going to paralyze the heart and the mind and the soul instead of the other way around. And folks, we've all had our experiences that these beliefs, you know, even if something is bad, a truth is bad, a negative thing, at least if you know it and accept it, you can progress and go on from there. Even if, if your kid died, if you were in denial about that, you would become paralyzed for years to come 
and ever progressing and going on. At least if you accepted the fact that your child was dead, I'm bringing this up because I'm rem uh, being reminded of an aunt of mine whose only son was killed in a car wreck uh, the year after I was born. And I grew up knowing this woman is paralyzed mentally and emotionally the rest of her life because she wouldn't accept. I mean, she was setting place uh, settings at their table for her son because he was going to come home. But even if the truth is bad, it's good to accept it. And that's what Christianity also will not allow us to do with each other, is accept the truth about each other. We, want, we have to judge each other. We have to pass judgment instead of accept the truth and let's deal with whatever we've got to deal with instead of becoming the judges of the entire world, even our brothers and sisters. He says, um, for by grace are you saved through faith. Now, and listen, listen to what he says, and this again proves to me that it is the faith of Jesus Christ. And he says, and that not of yourself. What saves you? Grace and faith. Are either one of them your grace? Is it your grace? It is equally not your faith. <laughs> it is what Paul said. It is the faith of Jesus Christ. He says, lest any man should boast. And my God, if there's anything that typifies modern day evangelical Christianity, it's boasting. Either that you believe or you want somebody to believe. It's, or whatever the testimony may be. Wherefore, remember that being in time past Gentiles in the flesh, who are called uncircumcision by that which is, uh, I'm sorry, I skipped, uh, let me go back to verse 9, not of works, lest any man should boast, for we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus. Ah, did we believe our way into Christ Jesus? We were created in Christ Jesus. That is an awesome statement, folks. We were created in Christ Jesus. This is the new creation that is spoken of. Do you know that, that through the second Adam, there was actually a whole new creation that never existed before on this earth? God created one body. One body. And he created it in himself and included the entire human race. You know, it's always been so difficult. You know, we've, I know, even in my most evangelical times of my life, and I, there's no one here is going to compare their evangelical persuasions with mine. I was as evangelically persuaded as anyone. I've burnt the bottoms of my feet off going out witnessing to people. I've knocked on doors till about dropped dead at the end of the day. I've done that for years and years of my life. It's, it's not as though that I'm trying to undo something that I didn't want to do. I've done it. I've done it. I qualified more than anybody that I know personally. I, I don't know how many people have ever done those things day after day, year after year, for uh, long, long periods of their life. I believed what evangelical Christianity said. I thought it was foolish to hold a job while people were going to hell. I thought it was stupid to try to save enough money to buy a car when I could give everything that I had. I thought it was ignorant to try to get an education while people were going to hell. I believed it. I did it. But it never, ever satisfied my soul. It never, ever gave me the confidence that I so desperately needed before God, even though I could compare my soul winning with anybody's soul winning who ever won a soul on all the souls on the face of the earth. And I'm glad I did. Did you say, was it worthless? Well, no, it wasn't worthless. What did you lead them into? Oh, now I just understand what I led them into. Now, I led them, at one, number one, I led them into a deception because I made them think that their believing redeemed them from hell. So the beat goes on. But I did convince them that Jesus Christ was Lord. So, I mean, 
it's not like it's a total total loss, but I just created somebody who was going to reproduce the same doctrine over and over and over again. In fact, I would say there may not be none of them that ever evangelized the way I did. Possibly not any. If there was, even if there was a tenth of one percent of them, that would probably be good high percentages, actually. But to think that we reason in our minds as Christians that there could be someone on the other side of this world whose life is lived so exemplary as what we would say are good works, as loving, as caring, all the way down the line. Every wonderful fruit of the Spirit. And these people do exist in other parts of the world who don't believe anything about Jesus whatsoever. They do exist. And that that person, because an evangelical Christian didn't get to them, when they die, they're going to burn in hell forever. But Mike, they, they've got to believe, oh no, they have the wonderful opportunity to believe. Not the law to believe, but now the freedom to believe in the one who's already redeemed them. It's the great gospel. He says, for we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus. Ah, man, I tell you, I just, I just want to stop there every time I get to it. It's hard to get past it. I was created in Christ. What an awesome statement. Created in Christ unto good works. You say, you don't believe in good works? Of course we do. But it's what we were created unto. Now, the fact of it is, to find out even what a good work is, you're going to have to get out of most Christian churches to find out what it is, because most of what Christianity calls good works, the Bible calls dead works. Which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. Wherefore, remember that ye, being in time past Gentiles in the flesh, who are called uncircumcision by that which is called the circumcision in the flesh made by hands, that at the time ye were without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel, strangers from the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world, but now in Christ. We've validated through chapter, verse after verse in two chapters who all is in Christ. It's those he predestined. But now in Christ Jesus, you who were sometime far off, he's speaking not about in this life, he's comparing Old Covenant to New Covenant. Not New Testament believer to uh, New Testament unbeliever. Who were sometimes the far off were made nigh by the blood of Christ. For he is our peace, who hath made both one, both what? There were only two groups of people on the earth in God's eyes, Jew and Gentile. There wasn't Caucasian and black and Japanese and, and, and uh, Hindu. There was two groups in God's inventory, Jew and Gentile. That's all it was. What did Jesus do? For he is our peace, who made both one. Now, whatever one is, the other is. God made Jew and Gentile one and has broken down the middle wall of division between us. And what happened? Modern-day Christianity came along and built it right back again. In fact, the wall now isn't just a wall. It's a maze of walls. Because the walls never end. Having abolished in his flesh the enmity or hostility even the law of commandments contained in ordinances why did he destroy all of that to make in himself of two in himself in himself when the law was abolished what did Jesus do he made in himself of Jew and Gentile one new man <laughs> He made it that, that way. Do you see man's decision in this at all? 
There is no, yeah, but Mike, it says over here, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. Yes, I agree. Believe, 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 believe. But believe because of the redemption. Don't believe to try to get it. Your belief cannot create anything contrary to the word of faith doctrine which I taught for 15 years. For to make in himself of the two one new man. He didn't just make them one. He didn't just say, okay, Jew and Gentile, I see you as one. Where did he make them one? In himself. Having slain the enmity or hostility thereby and came and preached peace to you which were far off. Did he come preaching the redemption? He came preached peace. Peace has been declared already. Peace between Jew and Gentile. And therefore, unifying one in Christ, therefore, hey, the gospel of peace to them which are far off and to them which are nigh. For through him, we both have access. <laughs> the only two groups of people, the groups of people on earth in God's eyes were not believers and non-believers. It was Jews and Gentiles. And now both Jew and Gentile has what? Access by one Spirit unto the Father. Now therefore you are no more strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and of the household of God, and are built upon the foundation of the apostles and the prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone, in whom all of the buildings fitly framed together groweth unto a holy temple unto the Lord, in whom ye also are builded together for what? For a habitation of God through the Spirit. I didn't expect to get that much out of this to be real honest with you. There are statements in here that are so emphatic. They are not vague. All that we read in chapter 1, all we read in chapter 2, is so conclusive. The questions always come, yeah, but the Bible says you got to believe. Well, that was the requirement that everyone failed at. I'm so glad everybody failed at believing. You know, hey, it's just the same as the law. What if one person would have succeeded at becoming righteous through the law? Ah, oh, what if one person would have succeeded at believing? And actually, if one would have done it, that would have been the only one who had ever got it. Because God didn't, wasn't outgrading on the curve. I am so thankful that Moses' law eliminated everyone from redemption and God's requirement to believe in Christ that God had sent his only son into the world that that requirement was also a complete failure on man's part. And at that moment when the entire human race was con con concluded to be in complete disobedience and unbelief, Christ died for the ungodly. And now on this side of the cross, we have so much wonderful teaching about what Paul says believing will do. We believe to the saving of the soul. We grow in knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. We grow in grace. Our minds are transformed. We have the, the, to the renewing of the mind. And it is a process that absolutely is constantly liberating and freeing more and 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 more. Absolutely. Because of redemption. Not because of belief. <laughs> we'll have to let Rod Parsley know about that because he said 51% were going and then just, sorry. Number one, uh, I, I think that he was uh, simply letting us know again that works 
weren't going to get it. That was a parable to the Jews. N number one, I don't know that I'd, I'd have to go back. It seems as though I understood that one time. But um, uh, uh, that parable was before the cross. It was not something that was on this side of the cross. I do believe that all the parables that Jesus spoke were the types and shadows of what he was about to do. I don't remember that one in particular uh, as to what its full implica implication is. We, we know that others, how, that the, how many of the others changed, as you said, the, those parables begin to change drastically as we look at it. I, I remember when I realized that the kingdom of God was not the pearl of great price. I just, I freaked. I freaked that it wasn't me. That, you know, he says the kingdom of God is like a man who found a pearl, found a, 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 a pearl, and that pearl was in a piece of land, and that he wanted that pearl so much that he went and sold and gave up all that he had to buy the land so he could have the pearl that was found there. And we, you know, how that in the evangelical Christian community we're taught that the pearl of great price was the kingdom of God. And you have to give up everything to really experience and have the kingdom. But as this gospel came, I began to see those parables just begin to just turn upside down, and I saw that the pearl of great price was me. And the man who found the pearl was Jesus. And the one who gave up everything he had to buy it and purchase it was Jesus. And I tell you, you talk about giving yourself a little bit different view of yourself when you realize that Jesus sees you as the pearl of great price, which he was willing to give up everything for to purchase you. Even those verses, you are the purchased possession. You're, you're the purchased possession. And it's nothing that says that we purchased the kingdom. It says that we are the purchased possession. The parable of the, uh, the, parable of the, uh, uh, the Samaritan is so powerful. You know, and we were all taught to be good Samaritans out of that. That's not the revelation that's in that. That incredible thing tells us that the religious man passed by, and the man was bleeding and dying, the, the uh, uh, politician passed by, and, and, and all the different ones. But then the Samaritan came, and he picked uh, the one rejected. That's what basically you read Samaritan. You just talk about the rejected ones, uh, where Israel was concerned anyway. But the Samaritan picked him up and carried him in and poured in the oil and wine and fixed him up and carried him in to the inn. And guess what he said? He said, okay, I'm checking him in to this inn. And now every debt that is acquired while he is here is to be charged to my account. Folks, that inn is the kingdom of God. And Jesus picked us up. We didn't get there by ourselves. We were all bleeding and dying, and he scooped up the human race, checked us into the kingdom of God, and said, now every debt ever accumulated by them is to be put on my account. Awesome. That's found in Romans, and that's Romans chapter 9, I believe. But the vessels of wrath were the people under the first covenant. The vessels of dishonor were the people under the first covenant. The vessels of honor and the vessels of mercy are the people under the second covenant. And it says, in fact, he says, what is any business of yours if God chose to reveal his wrath to the vessels of dishonor? And but then to turn around and show his mercy unto somebody else. And, uh, uh, and, and in fact, it says, is it any business of yours that he took of one lump of clay and made one vessel out of one lump made one a vessel of dishonor and made one a vessel of honor. One to experience wrath and judgment, the other to experience nothing but mercy and grace. Those are types and shadows of the two covenants, not good and bad Christians or believing and unbelieving people. Because whatever they are, it says God made the lump the way he wanted it. So if they're unbelieving, then God made them unbelieving and they have no choice in it anyway. It just so happens that God made everyone on this side of the covenant, on this side of the cross, we're all met vessels of mercy. And everyone on the other side of the cross is vessels of wrath. But based on the disobedience, remember it was the children of 
rat, and it's synonymous with the statement children of disobedience. It didn't say disobedient children. The children of Adam's disobedience. We are the children of the second Adam's obedience. 